Well, today is Super Bowl Sunday, so I thought it was a good day for a sports metaphor. Have you ever either played a sport or watched a sport where there's a ball involved or a racket or a club or a bat? Probably. Chances are pretty good. <laughs> and so you probably have noticed that there's this key important thing that happens to follow through. And when we follow through, the ball goes where we want it to go. When we don't follow through, we can end up in the weeds, out of bounds, off the court. We can even end up hurting ourselves or hurting someone else. So follow through is really key. And actually, the truth is, it's the same with spiritual principles. Follow through is practicing and implementing the things that we know to be true. So today, as we move into principle number five, we see this key that these ideas, these principles are completely devoid of life unless we pick them up and breathe life into them, unless we live them and follow through by practicing and implementing them day after day after day. Principle five, the way that we say it, is it's not enough to just know these principles. We must live them. So here we go. Principles number one and four embodied by us and lived by us. Let's remind ourselves of what they are. This is the short abbreviated form, so it's easy to remember. The first one is the nature of God. We can shorten that to God is. We often explain that as an all-loving presence, a permeating presence of the universe, a, a sense of goodness. Um, you can fill in the dots with what your God is, but you get it. It's the nature of God. The second one's about the nature of us, that we are in essence divine. We shorten that to I am or I am divine. And then it's like we take those two principles and what do we do with them? It, it starts to become the rest of the practices or principles start to have a little practice in them. The, second, the third one, co-creation, we, we co-create with, with spirit by thinking and feeling. So we think and feel God is, I am. We pray and meditate God is, I am as one of our key practices. And then we simply live it. So that's the short form. Think it, or uh, God is, I am, think and feel it, pray and meditate it, live it. So these divine gifts, the, the divine gives us gifts, actually. The, these gifts are our principles, are these guiding ways of living in which we can remain aligned with the divine and bring it forth. It, the divine needs us. That principle that permeates the universe needs form. It needs our body temples. It needs our soul's journey and our thinking minds and our feeling hearts to bring it forth. How else would, would we know or realize this on earth? How else would that presence be felt and, in, and, and an inspiration for ourselves and for others unless we are willing to be those hands and feet? And so that's such a key part is the willingness, a, a willingness to give back to the divine, you could say. And, and what do I mean by that exactly? Well, it can show up in a lot of ways. I think the scripture really illuminates uh, the way that kind deeds are really a gift back to the divine by giving to others. It's probably familiar to you. It's a really beautiful one from Matthew 25. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. So truly, I tell you that whatever you did for one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So that circle is complete. That law of circulation of giving and receiving is complete when we think of the gift that we have of life itself and then the gift that we have when we come into spiritual principles that really resonate with our own hearts and the ability then to, to embody them, to live them. It gives us, that alone gives us a sense of exciting purpose in life to, to really go deeper into what these teachings are. But what they look like in life is, is the key, Right? And that's what we're all about here. So if, if we think about the, the principles, we might think of them typically like these actions that we just talked about in the scripture. We might think of it as, oh, principle number five is serving. Principle number five is sacred activism. Yes, it is. And 
it's also just as much about being as it is about doing. Because we can't really live these principles fully if we don't do the work first in consciousness. And it's the consciousness work that precedes the action that is really key. So we can see examples of this everywhere in our society, even really unexpected places. Like, for example, did you know that economists predict what's happening in the economy by measuring essentially the group consciousness that's happening, the collective consciousness? So in other words, if people are feeling good about the economy, then it thrives if they feel positive. If they are feeling fearful and contracted, then we might go into a recession. So the way that we think and feel as, as a collective or individually has that constant effect on what happens on, in the outside, what gets reflected and mirrored back to us as, as the inner work that is happening. So consciousness is a key. Acting from a particular consciousness is what creates what we want or what we don't want. Also, in the sense of beingness for this principle, we could think about the quiet things that we do, the sort of behind-the-scenes things that we do, like when we pray. Or do you ever just practice silently blessing people? I mean, it's really great to do it when somebody's ticked you off. That's ideal, you know, in traffic or something, you know. If you can shift into, let me just bless that person. Who knows what's going on in their lives, you know. Send them some energy, some love, some sense of peace. Or we could do it just, you know, wherever we go, you know, taking a walk, all the people you might pass when you're taking a walk, and just send blessings. I mean, what if we all decided to send the blessing of health and wholeness to every person that we met, and including ourselves? We could have a really major impact on pushing ourselves through this pandemic. So there's lots of things that we can do. But beingness is, is that, that, whether it's through thoughts or feelings or shifts in consciousness, it's that work that, that makes a, an important impact on the action. So let's look at the five principles, or the, at least the, the four, because it's really the embodiment of the four, right? The first one, again, the first principle we know, we understand, it's the nature of God and it's how we describe God. But what's really key is then... What's the question of how do we live it? How do we live that principle? That can be kind of a head-scratcher at first blush. But as you begin to feel into it, you realize, wow, yeah, I know how I live that principle. I live it through my faith. I live it through activating that power of faith and then demonstrating the trust that I have, the trust that we might have in a greater and bigger picture of something, that trust that there is a divine order to the universe, that there is something more at work here. And when we do work this principle, fear takes a back seat. I saw somebody wearing a baseball cap the other day that said faith over fear. That's it. <laughs> that kind of encapsulates this principle in a nutshell. It's about putting faith first over fear, surrendering to the highest part of who we are, it's about dancing in the mystery, letting go and letting God. It's about letting our faith be in control rather than struggling for our ego to feel a sense of control. Being comfortable, a little more anyway, with the unknown. And when we do, then we can let this, this very essence of God, goddess, and the magic of it take place in our lives. So th there's a lot we can do with principle number five to live it, to embody it. The second one, the I am, the nature of us, this is one of the real distinguishing factors, I think, for us in new thought um, compared to many other of the mainstream religions. Um, Hinduism certainly has this idea of the innate divinity. Um, and so what, what it's about, really, right, living, living it, living that knowing that we are divine, what a difference that is than living, it's, it's exact opposite really, is living from a sense of I'm not enough or I'm not worthy. And we have plenty of reinforcement for that. In fact, the church itself has really taught that. I remember Augustine, who was a spiritual leader and very influential person, he struggled with his own sexual desires. And it is out of that man's struggle and his power and influence that we have this church doctrine called original sin that has just 
permeated through, you know, eons <laughs> and various expressions of religion, Christianity in particular. And look at where it's gotten us, right? This idea that we are born inherently sinful, inherently shameful. How can that be when in Genesis it's proclaimed that we are made in the image and likeness of God? And if we are made in the image of like, likeness of God, it seems much more likely that what would follow from that is coming into the world born of an original blessing, born of original virtue. That's the way we like to speak of it in unity. And it turns everything around. And it also means that a lot of times we have a lot of old programming to get through, right? When we first come into contact with some of these principles, it, it takes us by surprise because we've had all these mental impressions otherwise. And so it takes a little unpacking, a little undoing, a little untying to begin to expose that splendor of divinity that is within us and to live it. But when we first catch hold of that idea and it, it, it begins to resonate as a divine idea, for most of us, it doesn't let us go. And we continue to walk that journey of of revealing more and more of that truth. And then living, you know, a life of joy and purpose that comes from that. So seeing also when we experience and live this principle, this second principle, this innate divinity, it's about seeing the highest and best truth in ourselves and in one another. It's an easy sort of platitude to say. <laughs> it's a whole other thing to live it, isn't it? To live from that place. When, when somebody pushes our buttons, you know, to be able to see the divinity in them. But the more we practice, the more we can cut through that dross of judgment and criticism and things that keep us separated from the truth in someone else or the separated from one another and the love and connection between us or seeing ourselves. And so it's just a practice. One of the things that I like to practice with, and you can just do it with your physical eyes anytime, is to um, go from the, the crisp focus that we might look out into the world with and just soften your focus. And as you soften your focus, you might notice that, thing, that you yourself soften, that the world becomes a little more expansive and open. If we can look to each other and ourselves in that way, I think it's a nice pathway into a greater sense of seeing one another in that place of truth, in our place of divinity. Some places in Africa have a really unique way that they approach their criminals. So if somebody commits a crime, they invite that person into the circle of the tribe. And instead of punishing that person, they tell that person and remind that person of who they are. They tell them about the good that they see in them. They tell them about their characteristics and attributes that are positive and helpful to the whole community. The whole idea is that that person who made a mistake, who committed a crime, did just that. They temporarily forgot who they are. And so the tribe's remedy is to remind them because obviously they simply forgot who they are. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? That is the second principle in action. And so maybe we should all do that for one another. Ron Salazar shares a little bit about his experience with principles number two and three, really. Let's take a look. Hello, my friends. It is really good to see you. Even though I can't see you, it's really good to see you. I'm here this morning to speak about my experience as a co-creator with God. I first heard about this principle when I began my education to become a licensed unity teacher about 20 years ago. When I first heard about it, I did not understand it. It was very confusing and could not grasp it. But now, today, I understand why I couldn't grasp it. And it's because for the first half of my life, I lived a life of feeling I had no self-worth and that my life was fear-based. And as I began my spiritual walk at about 31 or 32, as I walked my path, 
I began to understand that I am, am worthy, and at that time I was worthy. And as my faith in myself grew, my fear dissipated. And so by the time I got to my licensing to be training, I was ready to hear about me being a, a co-creator with God, but not ready to grasp it. And so during those last 10, 15 years, I have grown to understand why I am here. And many, many years ago, I realized what my motto for life is. And my purpose is this. It is to help people find their God. And so my creativity is not playing on the NFL field like Joe Montana or Tom Brady or not playing in a rock and roll band like Jimmy Page or singing like Nat King Cole or making movies like Steve Spielberg or painting like Picasso. My creativity is about bringing joy and peace to people to my brothers and sisters. And I think I do that well when I let when I let myself be a co-creator with God. I love to make people laugh. And before this pandemic, we would get together once a month on Sundays and we'd laugh together. And I love that. And sometimes my words can be even inspirational. And so today, I know that all that comes from being a co-creator with God because when I also do make bring people peace and happiness and when I inspire people, it's expressing God. It's not just me, but it's God and me as a tandem, as a partnership. I love you. Peace out. Notice the real action that takes place in Ron's story, right? It's the shift in consciousness. He goes from thinking that he's unworthy to moving into a new idea. I'm a co-creator. And that that brings himself inspiration to then begin to live that out. So that's really how it works for us. It's just that we, we will forget, you know, once we've made the shift, most of us human beings, we will forget, but the more practiced we are, the quicker we get back on track and the less often actually we forget. So the only difference, you know, often in this principle, we talk about, well, who's Jesus? If this is the nature of us, who's Jesus? And really the main difference to remember is that Jesus didn't forget. <laughs> He just didn't forget who he was. And we forget and remember and forget and remember typically. So the masters tended to remember and stay in that consciousness. And we have that potential and capacity as well. So we don't have to buy into the idea that I definitely will forget. But we can be kind and compassionate with ourselves if we do. Principle number three, co-creation. A lot of it is really the essence of it is about focus. Where do we focus our attention? Where are your thoughts and feelings focused? And then the action will come through that place. Where's my energy and attention right now is a good way to just kind of notice where we are. And then through that law of attraction, we know that we attract like energies, right? We attract like situations in our lives based on what we are holding in our hearts and our minds. So we can choose again and again. No, I'd rather have that than that. And we might see a problem, but instead of going deep into the problem and all the worry and concern that we can get into around that, instead we could look at the same problem or two different people could look at the same thing and one could see the problem and go down that rabbit hole and the other one could see a solution, see a possibility, see an opportunity. It's all a matter of where we are in our thoughts, and our feelings, and what we're holding overall in our consciousness. Also a part of this um, co-creation and focus is really focusing on what we are for versus what we are against. There is a whole lot of what we are against in our society as we all well know and see played out in the news over and over again. But what we also know as spiritual students is that when we focus 
on wherever we focus and put attention on, we get more of that. So it might seem easier, but in fact, frankly, it's lazier to just rail against whatever it is we don't want. Instead, if we say, well, I noticed I don't want that, so what do I want? That's where the work happens. Asking ourselves, what do I want? And then, you know, feeling into that, noticing how that might come about, and then following through. That's principle five, basically, in a nutshell. Ellen Devonport, who wrote uh, the Five Principles book, has this really nice metaphor that I'll just read right from her book on considering this idea in principle number three that life is like a buffet. She says, picture this. You're at a buffet table. Ooh, I should have brought my glasses. <laughs> Laden with food. And some of you like some of it. And some of it, or I'm sorry, see? Okay. Some of it you like and some of it you don't like. Would you throw a tantrum about the food that's there that you don't like that is on the buffet table? Probably not. I don't think most of us would. And would you insist that that food now be removed? Would you con uh, condemn the people who are enjoying different choices of food than you are? Or would you simply focus on what you wanted, put that on your plate, and ignore the rest? So if we think of it that way, it's maybe a little bit easier if we catch ourselves getting caught up in all the political divide and the for or in the what we're against, we could just say, maybe I'll just consider this like a buffet table. <laughs> I could make a different choice. I could choose to watch something that informs me, but actually makes me feel pretty good. Or that I choose to feel good about what I can do or what good I hear and see. What possibility and potential lies in that story. So when we pray and meditate, we really operationalize principle number three. We also connect with the allness of God, right? The ever-present goodness, the love. When we move, we, we uh, nurture our faith when we move into places of prayer and meditation. We remind ourselves of the truth of who we are. We see that we feel and experience that sense of oneness, that inseparability between us and the divine. All of that comes out of the, pr the practice of prayer and meditation. So you can see why we consider that such a key practice in unity, because it makes all of these principles come alive. So we can also completely turn our lives around through these practices. Catherine Ramadi is a brand new Unity of Walnut Creek member. She's been coming for a while, but she's, she just became a member. And she has this message for us. Let's take a look. Hi, everybody. I'd like to share with you how I live the fourth principle of meditation. Many of you know that I am a meditation teacher, but a lot of people probably don't realize how long I've been meditating for. I first learned to meditate when I was 16 years old, and I was a very depressed, troubled teen. I was taking drugs, I was skipping school, I was hanging around with the wrong people, I was drifting, very depressed, I was a mess. And then I found this course, it was a mind development meditation course, and it was two weekends and a night in the middle. And when I joined and started, I had this terrible rash, like a nervous rash that was spreading on my chin, and it just got worse and worse the more um, I would put stuff on it. But by the end of the week, first weekend, it was gone. It was completely healed. And I think it was just a nervous rash from my anxiety and also the drugs. So the meditation cured that right away. And then by the time I finished, I was so excited about what I was learning. I ended up jogging on the beach every morning before school. I became a vegetarian. I found new friends. I had this healthy lifestyle. I meditated every morning before school. I meditated at night. My grades went through the roof. I ended up off the probation list, instead of getting kicked out of school, I ended up going on to get a degree, a BA in psychology, so I could learn more about the mind and the brain. And meditation was always there for me. I would teach people in my dorm room 
some of the things I knew and learned. So it's see why meditation and why I'm so passionate about it is because it really did turn my life around. It did change my life for the better. And now I have a meditation app called Tranquil Me. And I have made it my goal to spread peace through the world through meditation, because meditation is a path to peace. And if we can spread peace by being peaceful ourselves, one person at a time, who knows? Maybe, just maybe, we could have world peace one day. So thank you, Unity. I hope you enjoyed my story. Namaste. Well, big thanks to Catherine and to Ron for sharing their stories with us today to illuminate how we as a community are walking the path. A simple way we can tell if we're on principle is how we feel. Do you feel good? Chances are you're living the principles. When you're feeling down and disappointed and angry, I don't know, we might have fumbled there. We might have stepped off the field. And all we have to do is step back on by pausing, looking within, affirming something of truth, maybe finding first something that we're grateful for. And that can kind of snowball into moving us up the ladder of emotional experience and spiritual vibration. So how are you doing with these principles? I've created a few guiding questions that might help you for each of the principles. Let's walk through them for a moment. The first one is, you can ask yourself, am I feeling attuned to the divine wisdom and love that is available to me? Where's my faith right now? That would help us illuminate where we are with principle one. Principle two, am I looking past my own or other shortcomings to the innate divinity in them or in me and calling it forth, naming the good that I see? As I mentioned earlier, maybe try some soft focus with that as one of the techniques. For the third principle, you could ask, am I taking responsibility for my thoughts and feelings that are attracting situations and co-creating my life? And finally, am I praying and meditating? Am I listening, listening to spirit and speaking truth? Practice, practice, practice. That's what we're all about here, to illuminate these ideas, to live them. Taken together, God is, I am. Think it and feel it, pray it and meditate it, and now let's live it. I want to invite you to affirm with me these truths. Together, God is and I am. I think and feel it, pray and meditate it. I live these principles, and so it is blessings.